for a 20 bro. Doob it up. Ooh. Ooh, I'm high. I'm high. When you're thinking weed, when you're thinking of marijuana, you're thinking Bob Marley, all right? I'm thinking Bob Marley. I'm not the biggest fan of drugs. I don't drink, I don't really do anything like that. But I was reading this article and it was a breakdown of this entrepreneur, Charles Jones, who went from Fortune 500 consultant to founder of a venture-backed company called Lucid Mood or Angel Backed. They raised a series to help this thing and, and his whole pitch is, there's a lot of people that go in there that wanna get high as fuck, all right? They wanna get stoned. But there's also an entirely different market that want what Charles calls weak weed or a balanced botanical terpene blend. That's actually what he calls it. He's like a scientist. And he has identified this entire market of people that don't want to get super high. They're older people usually, or people that weed doesn't appeal to because it's, you know, it gets you, <laughs> gets you too high. I don't like it, personally. I don't like doing it. So that's what this interview's about. We also talked a lot about how he raised money, how he got into these dispensaries. There's an entire process that you have to go through when you're starting a weed company in order to even get into dispensaries. There's a third party you have to contract with. It was a whole thing. So we talked about how he did that. We talked about how he came up with his selling process and an insight that he had, which allows the salespeople in these dispensaries to immediately identify when somebody's going to be a good fit for lucid mood. Even if you're not in the weed industry, there's a lot in this interview about learning your target market, figuring out what they want, and then identifying specific words that they say so that you'll be able to sell more effectively to them. So here we go, in full, the Alex Berman podcast interview with Charles Jones. If you wanna get these interviews early, you can subscribe to the podcast on Spotify and iTunes. Let's jump into it. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Today we're talking to Charles Jones. He's the founder and CEO of Lucid Mood. Lucid Mood has mastered the art of enhancing mood uh, to a certain level of consistency. Basically, they sell low potency vaping products. I saw a write up on Green Entrepreneur about Charles and figured it's it, it's very interesting. He he has a very interesting story. So I wanted to to bring him on the podcast. Charles, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Alex. It's a privilege to be here. For sure. The one thing I wanted to, I guess, start with was, so you're a cannabis entrepreneur, and I'm putting on like air quotes, um, but I guess that's, that's true as well. Um, but you started, you were super corporate before this. I've had an interesting career. I spent uh, a decade in um, software, uh, Silicon Valley uh, and whatnot, and then I did a dot-com in the day from 1999 to 2001, and that was my first experience with raising venture capital and doing something at scale. Um, and then after the bubble burst, I went back to corporate America to become a organization development consultant and executive coach. And I was coaching Fortune 500 executives when the idea for Lucid Mood appeared. So what did that, what did that switch look like in your mind? So actually, um, if you wouldn't mind, I, I think I butchered the pitch for Lucid Mood. So what exactly is Lucid Mood? Uh, you didn't do badly. Um, <laughs> so Lucid Mood really has two claims to fame. Um, so the first is that we start with purified cannabinoids and terpenes. So we're not really starting in the whole strain paradigm. Um, and we are very selective about which cannabinoids and terpenes we use to create a specific desired effect, uh, whether it be you know, enhance sociability or decrease pain. Um, and then we also dial out the annoying side effects that keep so many people from uh, appreciating the benefits of cannabis. So things like paranoia and social withdrawal, forgetfulness, just feeling kind of tired and cloudy, you know, an hour and a half, two hours after you've consumed. So we eliminated those side effects um, to really create a product that's incredibly approachable to a mainstream consumer. Yeah, the way I heard it written about was you're like uh, selling weak cannabis product on purpose. And it's because there's this whole market that doesn't want to get, they don't want to get super high when they go into dispensaries. And it's like weed is scary to them and you're making it more accessible. Exactly. 
exactly. I, we, we would quibble with the weak part in the sense that um, if other products that use kind of microdosing as an approach to ensure the safety of the consumer, that that'll be a manageable experience, we approach it a different way. And we have ratios of cannabinoids and terpenes that allow you to experience the elevation associated with THC without the uh, debilitation, if you will, that is associated with THC. So it, it's really kind of a different approach. So you can actually get quite high on lucid mood, but you'll still be very functional. Interesting. So, um, okay, so when you first had this idea, you're coaching these Fortune 500 executives. Did you think you were crazy? Like, what, what, um, what were you thinking there? Well, I really sort of stumbled across the idea. And, um, you know, the two questions I had once I kind of created this hypothesis after reading the peer-reviewed literature on cannabinoids and terpenes, uh, that we could create such a product. Um, and then, you know, so first question is, okay, are my hypotheses correct? Um, how do we test this? How do we, so I assembled a small team and we did kind of a feasibility study to see if we could produce the results and the effect that we were planning to do. And for it was an initial team of six, and for all of us, it was the most enjoyable cannabis experience we'd ever had. Um, and we're all cannabis users, any, anywhere from kind of light to kind of fairly heavy. And then the second question is, you know, is there a market for this? What would be the business model? Where do we see the business going? So, you know, much more, um, you know, can we create a business from this and, and what would it look like? And I'm not sure I ever thought I was a crazy, but one one really a, a challenge, a kind of an emotional challenge for me is when I imagine telling my clients and my peers and uh, the companies I would sometimes subcontract to to get the coaching assignments, when I thought about telling these folks that I was starting a cannabis company, I actually felt ashamed. I know mm -hmm. I've used cannabis since 1976. It's been a long time. I always thought it was nuts that it, it was great, you know, le illegal. I thought that was nuts. But just the whole social, you know, pressure, especially in, you know, those kinds of communities, I was nervous about sharing this with, with my, my colleagues and my peers. And um, so I really wanted to be sure that this is something I was going to do and that it was going to be successful before I you know, went all in and I started telling people that this is what I was transitioning to. And, um, you know, my fears were actually uh, supported. I, I lost some relationships and friends and, you know, kind of like, oh, you're doing that thing. I don't know if I want to be associated with you anymore. So there, you know, the stigma was there. And this is three years ago. I think we've seen a lot of change across the country. Uh, there's much less stigma than there was even three years ago. Um, but that was, that was a hurdle to overcome. So what did that look like in terms of testing? So how did you make sure that you were validated before you started telling your clients and everyone else you were all in on this? Um, we ran the product through 600 consumers. Some, uh, a small number had never used cannabis before, uh, you know, maybe 5%. Um, and about a third of these people were people that had used in the past and kind of sworn it off for one of the side effects that we, we were thinking that we had eliminated. Um, and, you know, we got reactions, everything from, eh, it's really a little too mild for me. I'm going to stick with my concentrates and uh, to, uh, wow, this is really cool. I could see, you know, I'll use this on weeknights when I have to be super sharp the next day, but I, I still like my flower. I want to smoke my joint on the weekend. Uh, to, wow, I haven't used cannabis in, you know, 20 years. I tried it uh, a few months ago. I was just overwhelmed by the potency and everything. I really like what you've done here. You know, I hate pot, but I love this. Um, so, you know, after testing us with 600 people, we're like, you know, there's a market here. And, in, and uh, then the other stat that was really encouraging to us is we ran a, a large scale online survey and we found that 40% of adults are what we would call impairment intolerant, that their response to THC, they either you know, get paranoid or they get really lethargic or what was I saying? They're, they're just too dysfunctional to 
it's it's just a non-starter for them. Yeah, I always thought that was so odd. There's some people like because I, I guess I'm impairment intolerant or whatever whatever you Impo- just said. It, THC tolerant. <laughs> yeah, uh, because there are some people that can smoke it and then they're just like more productive and they can work and all that stuff. And I, I never saw where they were coming from. I couldn't. I never understood that. Well, what's interesting to me is you know I basically went through high school high all the time. Uh, Merit semifinalist, won a national title in chess. I, I did well, and uh, um, but you know, even even a few years out of a couple years out of college, I can't do that anymore. You know, it's 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 like uh, someone hands me a joint in the evening. It's like, well, what do I have going on tomorrow morning? No, I can't do this. Um, so, so I'm I haven't I haven't seen any research to even hypothesize why. Some people are much more tolerant for THC than than others, but there's there's definitely this um, this divide, and the stats kind of bear that out. Fifty percent of people who try marijuana give it up. So, what did um? How did you find these six hundred initial users? Like, what did that what did that acquisition process look like? Uh, friends of friends, largely, um, and you know at. At some point, we just, you know, we, we put the word out and uh, we had people come in for these marketing trials. And the marketing trials looked everything from, um, you know, single blind uh, study uh, to a small focus group to, in essence, what we call a testing party. Um, because one of the things that's true of cannabis that is much less true of uh, many other psychoactive substances is that your experience is highly dependent on the setting and environment that you're in. So, um, you know, for certain kinds of testing, we really need kind of a real life situation. So, and I can go further into that kind of um, later on when we say developed uh, our party blend, you know, we wanted it to be something that was uh, uh, very pro-social, increase your sociability, but also increase your energy and kept your energy high. Alcohol can increase your sociability, and there's an initial kind of burst of, of energy that comes from its lowering of your inhibitions. But after a few drinks, you're starting to drag, you know, and, and soar your words and, and make poor decisions and, and things like that. And we want something that was just really up and positive and outgoing. Um, so what situation are you going to test that in? You know, sitting with a researcher in a small you know, room, that's not going to do it. So we actually held, you know, parties where we would um, have people rate their level of energy and sociability at various points during the evening and tweak the formula until we got, you know, the desired sort of curve for the evening. That's interesting. So how much, um, what, did you raise investment before you jumped into this or was this all, all you self-funding at this point? So the initial team just agreed to work for free for the first year. Um, and we did raise uh, a small amount of funding from friends and family, a quarter of a million dollars, which we used for materials and, and kind of out-of-pocket expenses. And with that, we uh, so we incorporated in November of uh, 2015. And actually, actually, exactly this time this year, the day before Thanksgiving on 2016, we launched in our first dispensary in Colorado with the first four SKUs. Of lucid mood, um, and that took about a quarter of a million dollars. And then at that point, we went out and raised uh, additional capital. Uh, all in to date, we've raised uh, two million dollars through a series of, of rounds, and we are uh, we expect to announce our Series A uh, by the end of the month. That's awesome. Um, and then it, it's it's amazing that the year of research and development paid off as well. Uh, we just had somebody else on the podcast where they were talking about they did a full year of R&D and then it didn't work out. And then they had to like basically fold the company and start something else. Yeah. Well, our R&D has been you know, very important to us to be highly innovative on a number of fronts. And one of the first things we did after we launched the first few SKUs is um, we recruited a PhD neuroscientist to take our formulation capability to the next level. And... Um, it hasn't gone un- unnoticed. Um, we've, we've actually seven brands have approached us to formulate for them on a white label basis. And that will be an increasingly, uh, you know, a big chunk of our business going forward. So we'll have Lucid Mood as its own brand. 
formulated cannabis, and then we'll have these other brands that we'll be formulating for. So where did that thought come from of doing a full year of R&D, especially because you weren't in products before, right? Well, I was certainly in the software space, um, but uh, we have... So, so I have a software background as well. And that's that's the main reason I asked this question, right? Because we've got, you know, there's like Waterfall and then there's Agile where you're building and you're constantly releasing. And it seems like, at least to me, where if you move into products, it's going to be a lot slower. Um, was that your experience? Or? So my co-founder, a gentleman named Dave Georges, um, is... Uh, 35 year um, long career as a um, you know production engineer, so mechanical engineering degree, um, production engineer, everything from a small robotics startup to a Fortune 500 uh, medical device company, um, stuff like that. And he came up with this brilliant strategy for having a very agile. Uh, you know, he's definitely was cut kind of in the lean manufacturing. Uh, mindset. And so he came up with this very agile development platform where we punched, uh, we, we take a kind of a blanket of hemp made from hemp and we punch out little discs. And then we would impregnate those discs, if you will, where we'd squirt some a cannabinoid blend into uh, one kind of disc and then a terpene blend into the other kind of disc. And then we'd have users take the cannabinoid disc, put it in a dry flower vaporizer, inhale it, wait till it fully took effect. Um, and the cannabinoids take five, 10 minutes to reach the receptor sites and begin to produce their effects. But the terpenes hit in seconds. And um, so then they would take the, uh, the hemp pellet, the disc with the terpene formula in it, they would hit it and you, you could see from their body language and facial expression the head shift that they would experience as a result of the terpenes. So this turned out to be a really efficient and great development system for us, a way to really, you know, test. Um, so we did, you know, we did a ton of testing and tweaking and, and stuff like that. I, um, um, and, you know, kind of interestingly, the initial... I, I sketched out five initial formulas before we did any uh, did any testing. Four of them w verbatim were what we launched with, but actually it took us a, a, a long time to really validate that it did what it said and that any adjustments in of the ratios in any direction would lead to an inferior effect than the one that we were producing. And then part of the other part of the R&D is when you're, uh, combining these cannabinoids and, and terpenes and putting them into a vaporizer device, uh, you know, like a disposable vape pen. Um, there's issues of viscosity and, and other such things. And uh, Dave was just masterful at figuring that out and, and fine tuning um, until we got, you know, a product that worked, you know, very reliably and kind of like Maxwell House. It was good to the last drop, you know, the, the terpene cannabinoid blend. Um, was remained correct in, within within the desired parameters from the first hit through the last hit. That's interesting. So you really, I mean, it's like you took a, a long term view on this because, like the the opposite side of that is test it for a couple weeks, make sure the blend is almost there, then start doing manufacturing as soon as like I you could probably rush something like this out in four or five months. So the fact that you actually did it right, you took a full year to test it. I think that says something about your mindset. Well, thank you. I think the mindset that's behind that is the the vision from day one was to build a national brand, you know, ideally the most approachable national brand of cannabis. And um, in a brand, in our mind is, you know, it's a promise. And uh, people buy the promise once, they're not going to buy the promise twice unless you fulfill on the promise. And the promise we made at the time we were making it, a lot of people considered outrageous. Oh, sure, I recognize that different strains have different effects. But you're telling me you cracked the code and you figured out which terpenes do what and which terpenes you needed to remove in order to reduce the cloudiness and stuff and what the right ratio of THC to CBD is to get the elevation without the stupefaction. We got a lot of pushback and skepticism you know, from people that, we could even do what we were saying we could do. Um, and I would say 80% of the angel funding that we, we got was 
I do my pitch. I have a conversation with the potential investor. And he or she would say, well, can I try the product? If your product does what it says, I'm in. And I would just smile from ear to ear because we knew we had them. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. How did you um, how did you get your first customer? So it's it's B two B to C, right? It sounds like you were selling mostly through d- dispens. Do you have to sell at dispensaries? You can't just like go and like sell it out of a parking lot with with marijuana products, right? Right, right. It's actually even a little bit more complicated than that. Um, in so, you know. THC is still a Schedule One substance. It's federally illegal. I want to raise money from uh, anyone in the United States. So we made a decision early on that we would not touch THC. We would not touch the plant. Um, we would not break any federal laws. So we pursued a kind of Coca-Cola bottling model in which we would partner with a bottler, so to speak, in each state where that bottler was had a license from the state to manufacture THC infused products. So first thing we had to do is find a bottler in Colorado. So we're based in Boulder, Colorado. We found a bottler in Denver, Colorado, and actually pulled him in as one of the founders uh, of the company. And uh, he had a a facility and whatnot. So he, he became our first licensing partner. So uh, we do an IP licensing deal with him, and then he, that business needs to go out and find dispensaries that are going to purchase the product from them, and then, you know, so it's B to B to B to C. Oh, that's, so he was selling on he was selling on your behalf. Correct, and and we have bottlers in uh, now in Colorado, Oregon, uh, Delaware, uh, Rhode Island, uh, and Maryland, and Nevada. That sell on our behalf. So, what did what did that look like? Um, I guess how many meetings did you had to go, did you have to go through with different bottlers in Colorado? Like, how did you how did you find this guy? Like, where did that how did that whole thing come together? Well, he actually found me because I made a uh, a presentation looking for investment capital to um, an angel investment group, and it was via webinar. He was on the webinar. As soon as I got off the the webinar, my phone rings, and it's him. And uh, um, his name is Patrick O'Malley. He, his his business is called Good Life Colorado here in Colorado. Um, so actually, he he found us. Uh, the next uh, licensing partner is uh, actually a publicly traded company that's a multi-state operator called MeriMed. And um, Mary, I was introduced to MeriMed by uh, a colleague in common, you know, in the industry who thought we would be a good match. Um, so they've 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 either found me or um, that we, we've had introductions. Um, we've had uh, I, we're going to be announcing also a partner in Arizona, and that was that was much more kind of an outbound. Who are the players? Who do we think would be the best match? Um, so you know, it's been some combination of people found me. There's there's been a, a mutual friend that's introduced us, or you know we've gone out to analyze a market, figure out who our best partner is and approach them. So the angel investor webinar, what is that? And like, how did you get into that circle? So there's a group called ArcView. Um, and it's a, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a club, if you will, of angel investors that are interested in the cannabis space. And at a given conference, there can be anywhere from like three to 600 accredited investors who are there. And uh, if you qualify in certain ways, you get to pitch from the stage. And then each of those angel investors makes their own personal decision about whether they want to invest in you or not. Um, so that uh, that's accounted for um, about 20% of the capital that we've raised and um, directly. And then, you know, often these um, angel investors run in little syndicates, if you will, or, you know, like they have friends who are also angel investors. Um, so once we won a few of those, they said, hey, I've got this friend. He'd, he'd like to invest too, or she would like, like to invest too. So, you know, it got, it's gotten progressively easier. You know, the friends and family, that was kind of easy. And then after that, it was really kind of an uphill battle. 
uh, to win our first few investors. And then, you know, it's just gotten much easier over time. And of course, we've been putting points on the board as well. And people are beginning to see us making progress and moving into other states and steadily growing sales in the states we're in. Um, you know, but it was, it was heavy, very heavy lifting at the beginning. And not at all, you know, a, a certainty that it was going to be successful. We never kind of lost the faith, but, you know, there were some white knuckle moments. So how do you deal with, or what was that process? So you have this bottling guy and he's going out and he's selling two dispensaries. He's trying to get your, your product to be sold there. Um, and you can't do anything. Like, can you help him along legally? Or like, what is that? What, like, how do you make sure he's doing his job? How do, how do you make sure that you have the right guy selling for you? Or person selling it, for you? It's, it's a great question. And um, uh, it, it varies by state and partner. So um, one of our partners has, uh, for instance, in Maryland, um, had an existing sales staff. They were incredibly enthusiastic about Lucid Mood. They saw it as kind of the tip of the spear for their branded product division. Um, so they consider us a partner brand. And they, um, Maryland's a state where, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's growing very quickly, the number of people that have medical marijuana cards. Um, so, and lots of novice users are walking into dispensaries. And so they were extremely successful in explaining to dispensaries, hey, you know, if a consumer walks in and you sell them a gram of flour or you sell them an edible, and it turns out they're one of the 40% that's in that impairment intolerant category, you may never see that consumer again. You may have lost a consumer for life. The industry may have lost a consumer for life, but if instead you encourage that person to, you know, uh, take lucid mood home with them, and it tends to be a much easier sale. You don't have to, you know, the consumer walks in and says, what's the difference between Indica and Sativa? You know, they're a naive user, right? <laughs> and so are you, is the bud tender going to spend the next 10, 15 minutes trying to explain that difference or the difference between blue dream and super lemon haze, or, are they just going to take our point of display out and hold it up in front of the consumer and say, what effect are you looking for? The consumer would say, oh, energy. I, I'd like energy or I want chill or I want party or I want pain relief or I want something to help me sleep. It's, the product is named that way. So it's super easy for the, for the consumer to select it. And the bud tender has that assurance that when that person takes the product home, they're going to have a great experience. They're going to come back to the dispensary. If they then branch out into a uh, conventional cannabis product, an edible or another vape pen or flower, uh, and they're in that impairment intolerant category, you haven't lost them for life. They'll come back a third time and say, hey, that stuff didn't work for me, but that Lucid Mood stuff, that was really good. Do you have any more of that kind of a thing? And the dispensary saw this play out exactly as predicted, and we're, we're killing it. You know, in, in Mark. Yeah, I bet because you have that. Well, you have that specific trigger. It's like if they're new, push lucid mood, like tell them about lucid mood. Uh, how did you, where did that insight come from? Um, like basically that whole thing of identify them, that, that question that they asked, is it indica or sativa? Like finding that trigger, where did that come from? I think that's one of those, uh, uh, oh my goodness, like this was obvious all the time. Why didn't we think of it before? Uh, kind, kind of a thing, but the, um, um, I, I, I think to some extent we fell into a trap that a lot of people, uh, marketers fall into, which is, you know, the product isn't just, you know, it's great for novice users. It's like the best product in the world for a novice user, but it's not just good for them. It's also good for the weekend warrior who needs to, you know, perform, you know, during the week and, can use lucid mood in the evenings and let loose with flower on the weekend or the soccer mom who, you know, uh, just wants to cut, take the edge off when she gets, you know, picks up the kids and, you know, you know, stuff like that. Um, so there are many other use cases besides the novice consumer, but that trying to explain to a bud tender who by and large is someone in their early twenties, who is the opposite of impairment intolerant, right? They, they, they can do a 40 milligram dab, you know, of pure THC and, you know, be advising you on what you should buy, you know, so they, they don't get it. They're not in that impairment intolerant category. Um, so 
when we first started going into dispensaries, one of our challenges was how do we get people for whom this is not a product by and large they would use to get behind it and um, become a champion for the product with the audience that is walking into the dispensary. And this evolved over time, but uh, we had uh, uh, one particular dispensary. We could see that the manager was like really intrigued about it. So he, he gets the samples, he distributes them for, to his staff. All the staff says, eh, super weak stuff, don't bother. Um, but but it, it, there's, there's something that has really grabbed him about the whole thing. So I, so I asked him, I said, is there anyone in your life that you think could benefit from cannabis who you know, doesn't like anything you've shared with them? And he lights up and he said, my dad is in chronic pain. I have tried. I, I own a dispensary. I've tried every product in a dispensary. He doesn't like them. Many of them relieve his pain, but he doesn't like how he feels. And I said, so I pull out our, our relief pen and I say, have him try this. You know, and I even like explained to him that it has three terpenes in it. One diminishes uh, pain at the point of injury. One reduces the amount of pain relayed to the brain. And the third one reduces the perception of pain in the brain. And this plus the one one ratio of THC to CBD, which is great on its own for pain and inflammation, um, the overall effect, this is like comparable to an opiate and it's pain relieving effect. And we have a clinical style trial in which people reported that level of, of difference. So I hand it to him and um, the next sales meeting I'm in, they're like, hey, we want a new dispensary. They placed an order with us yesterday. And I said, oh, which one is that? And it was this dispensary. So I call him up and he's like, yeah, it works great for my dad. He loves it. He really likes the effect. <laughs> and so that then became our strategy for getting into dispensaries. We'd meet with the buyer or the manager and we'd say, who do you have in your life that you know, you've tried to turn on to cannabis, it hasn't worked. Here's our hypothesis, they're impairment intolerant. Have them try this. And we've been way more successful getting into dispensaries since we took that approach. Amazing. All right, Charles, where should people go after listening to this podcast? They should go to lucidmood.net, L-U-C-I-D-M-O-O-D dot N-E-T. Awesome, thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Alex. Thanks for listening to another episode. If you want more content like this, subscribe to the podcast. If you want more in-depth B2B sales training, of course, check out the YouTube channel, b2bsalestraining.org. And if you need marketing support for your digital agency, Experiment 27 helps digital agencies grow their number of leads by building lead generation systems. That is Experiment 27. Dot com. There's also notes on all the podcast episodes there and free sales courses, which we've gotten some very good feedback about. You can also check out my social media. I'm on Twitter, Alex Berman with no E, A-L-X Berman or Instagram, Alex Berman one. Till the next episode, I will see you later. Burn, 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 burn.